I did a video recently on breadboards and parasitic and stray capacitance and how they mess up AC signals, as well as high frequency signals, which are basically AC signals. And that video was correct, but as my viewers astutely pointed out, a lot of what I was experiencing, the problems I was having, was also due to RF interference, or more properly, electromagnetic induction, my wires acting as antennae, and the human body, amongst all the other things it does, can act as a giant antenna. Back in my day, we had the little rabbit ear antennas. In England, I guess they would call them aerials. And sometimes you could actually improve the signal by going up and just having somebody hold on to it. And it was unfortunate when you got chosen to be that somebody. But you may have heard of RF cable or shielded cable, maybe opened up some cable and found a weird wire mesh inside. And you may have heard of something called a Faraday cage. Basically, and I'm only just dipping my toes into the broadcast world a little bit, so I'm just going to have to go by Wikipedia here. But basically, you can enclose some sort of electrical device, could be a circuit board, could be a wire, in a wire mesh or just solid metal. And what happens is, as the waves from the air, radio frequencies, your lights, your power, whatever waves are going through the air, they go through the metal outside, and they cause induction, which causes the charges to separate, according to Wikipedia. And this counters the actual wave, so that the induction, the actual energy spent, is in the Faraday cage itself, the shielding, not in the device. This is a metal baking tin. I checked with a magnet. It is magnetic, so it's probably steel in there, or perhaps coated iron. Two of these together, put one on top of the other, and you have a Faraday cage. I'd want to drill a hole for the wires, or just put them through. And I tried to do that, and I wasn't having a huge amount of success. I tested, and it definitely did work. The metal works as a Faraday cage. You can enclose something in just some metal baking tins, and very little is going to sneak through from the outside. But if you look here, this is a common base amplifier I have going on. And it's being fed by the function generator, the wave generator, on my oscilloscope. I chose this because the effects of capacitance are minimal. The stray and parasitic capacitance I talked about, it's basically doing nothing. I don't have any fancy inductors and oscillators in here. But what I did have was still the RF interference. And what would happen is I could very slightly change the positions of wires or just grab onto them, and the signal would clean up real nice. You'll notice that the signal is just fine right now. I'm actually doing this video backwards because I have fixed it and I'm gonna unfix it to show you. I don't feel like refixing it on video. So as it turns out, the vast majority of the RF interference I was getting was actually my signal generator coming out of the oscilloscope and I have the wires plugged into my breadboard. And that oscillation was actually radiating a surprising amount. And that's why putting the tin over it didn't work because I was closing the waves in. When I tried to exclude the signal generator and enclose everything else, the signal cleaned up. And the signal would also clean up if I wiggled where my wire was, but it got to be a pain. So I decided to try a Faraday cage or a shielded cable, which is just a cage around the cable. This is just tin foil, aluminum foil. And as you can see, it has, of course, made my cable nice and stiff. And it isn't all the way down. I'm still getting interference, but the point is I'm getting little enough that it doesn't matter. But I just wrapped foil around it. A shielded cable just does this more cleanly. It has, you know, stranded wires, uninsulated stranded wires, inside the insulation around the actual insulated conductors. It's just a Faraday cage made out of stranded wire instead of foil. But foil works just fine. No problems. It's down here right by my circuit board. You can see, I don't know, it's probably coming across. If I move it, you can see a very tiny variation, but not that much. There's one other thing. This is also going to be grounded. Now, you might say it doesn't seem to make a difference. And indeed, I'm touching and untouching, touching and letting go the grounding plug, and the signal doesn't appear to be changing. But hold on. Here, let me see if I can lift this up a little bit. These power supplies, if I don't throw it off my table, have three plugs. A black, a red, and a green. The black is the negative DC, the red is the positive DC, and the green is actually earth ground. Not connected to the neutral wire, just earth ground. This is safe to touch. 
it's connected, I'm directly touching the Earth ground right now. Because the Earth ground is a constant potential. If you have some device that has connected its neutral line and the Earth ground together, it's still safe because the neutral also is a static potential, or should be. Sometimes they connect it to Earth ground to make sure it is. If somebody has connected the hotline to the ground line, your house is on fire, or you need a new circuit breaker. So go do that and then come back. So what I'm going to do is zoom in. I'm going to zoom in on this yellow signal. Let me turn off the green so it's easier to see. I'm zooming in, and now you can see, if I pause it, there's a signal here. Let me zoom out a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. You can see what's going on is the signal ramping up and down. And I believe the stair step is just due to how the oscilloscope is detecting it, or actually generating it, probably. That's probably the function generator is creating the stair step effect. But anyway, you know, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. That's just the signal. And then you can see the little, if I zoom in this way, you can see how it goes up and down and up and down. There's that extra inductance on top of it. But if I let it play, you can see it's kind of messy. And if I touch it now, now that I'm zoomed in and we can see small noise, should be able to see, yeah, here especially, just by touching it, I am having an effect on, even through the Faraday cage, it's greatly diminished, but it's not perfect. If I do it over here, you can see it. But if I connect the earth ground, because remember the tinfoil is conductive, so with no earth ground, if I touch it in right this spot, the interference gets worse, and if I connect the earth ground and touch it in the same spot, the interference doesn't get worse. It kind of smooths out a little bit. It's hard to tell, you know, in this blur of noise. But it's really not getting any worse. It's not getting higher amplitude. And here's an even better example. Here I'm holding it, and I'm going to touch and let go. Touch and let go. Touch and let go. And you can see the interference goes down. So by grounding your Faraday cage, it gives it a path for those charges to sink. So it makes it a more effective Faraday cage. It doesn't just spread them within itself, because the charges have to go somewhere, conservation of energy. And the charges are spent in eddy currents, and it generates a tiny bit of imperceptible heat. But if you give the charges somewhere to go, then it's more effective because they just go straight out. The excess charge equalizes with the Earth ground. And then, of course, if I zoom out proper, so you can see the signal. The signal looks perfectly stable and touching Earth ground doesn't do anything because the Faraday cage itself, even not grounded, is having such a huge effect on nullifying it. Oh, can you see there? Perfect. I got it in just the right spot to interfere. You see this interference? Let me see. Oh, oh, not if I touch it there. That actually gets rid of it. Okay. If I can get this interference back. Oh, come back. See how hard it is? There we go. Oh, stay. Stay bad. Just touching Earth ground. Having my hand near it. Oh, here we go. If I let it go. What was happening is I was earth grounding myself, making myself a more effective antenna, sinking some, some energy. But if I touch it, look at this. Look at this right here. I get closer and closer, and I am an earth grounded antenna. And if I just touch it, touch it, firm contact, it's tin foil after all. Touch it or clip it on. Clip. And it goes away. I have looked for shielded cables, and they are available, but it's really, 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 really hard to find shielded breadboard cables, these jumper hookup wires. And even if you find them, they're expensive. So feel free to go and accidentally unplug your circuit, but feel free to go and just get some tinfoil. Let me plug this back in. There we are. And I seem to have kicked my camera. So as a final demonstration, I'm going to take the foil off of my cable using the same circuit for a comparison. And now without even having to set it down, you should be seeing some of the pain I've been going through. As I demonstrated in my last video, if I put it down about where the cable was, well, it seems to be behaving itself until I move it just right. There you go. That's pretty bad. That's even worse. Just sitting there. The cable is curved around just like it was before in the foil. If I put it down here, it seems to be this junction. This junction right here, where the cables get closer together, seems to be where it happens the most. But you can see right now, I mean, I was handling this cable, not having a problem. And now, even if I pause it, <laughs> even if I pause it, here, let me zoom in so we can see what's going on here. It's a delicious plate of spaghetti, isn't it? Like, I'll, I want you to keep in mind, if I can get it to behave for a minute, that's my actual wave. My setting is on 500 microseconds per division, half a millisecond. And if I zoom in so that you can see 
These waves that are being inducted, now the division is only 10 nanoseconds. That's the high frequency. I kind of want spaghetti now. So this isn't going to take care of the capacitance. You're still going to have problems if you have high frequency signals or you have things in just the wrong places. But there's very few circuits that you're going to be doing on a breadboard that are really going to present a problem. Mostly if you're trying to do some sort of oscillator. Like I said, I've had trouble with that, but the common bass amplifier I'm getting into seems to have helped. But a big thing you'll have a problem with at high frequencies in a breadboard is a computer. Like if you're trying to recreate or reproduce something like a Commodore 64 or a Z80 or TRS-80 or whatever, if your signals are going too fast, it might just mess them up. So if you're trying to do something like that, digital processing with a clock pulse, just try and slow down the clock. That'll give it time to settle despite the capacitance. And if you're having problems with RF interference in your AC signals, try wrapping your wires in foil. Try earth grounding them as well to your power supply. You can also get a power cable and rip out the power tines and just leave the ground. Make sure you know which one's ground before you do that. And don't forget your baking tin. This is an easy way to test a device as a whole. If you have a small circuit board, then you could just put it in here and you can close it up and shield it from the vast majority of outside waves. You know, have the wires running out here or drill a little thing, and you can cover them over a little bit with copper tape to seal it back up. But yeah, just make sure that they're conductors. Bring your magnet to the grocery store. So I hope this helps you as much as it has me on your breadboard adventures. So while you get ready for a grocery run, I'll be seeing you.